Hello everyone and welcome back to uh, Ravenscroft Reviews, conversations about CVI and again it gives me great pleasure to talk to uh, uh, my good friend and mentor Professor Gordon Dutton. Hello Gordon, how are you today? Hi, I'm well thanks John. Good, good, good. So today we're going to do something slightly different because um, as you know Gordon I, I go around and talk a lot and do, give a lot of presentations on, on, on CVI and childhood visual impairment and um, I get asked probably this question is either the first question I get asked or it's the second question I get asked but no matter what I get asked this question and the question is um, what's the relationship between um, CVI and autism and so I think um, if we can have a little conversation about that that would be really good but before we go down that huge topic I think it's useful if um, if you can help me and, and explain to me to understand really why vision and the development of vision is so important in the early years. I, I think I need to have a ground before we start that big, big topic. Give me a grounding in why vision is so important in the early years. Well, um, I think we should start at the uh, Nobel Prize winning work of Hubert and Wiesel uh, because they found that when they did experiments, which people wouldn't like, of closing the eyelids of kittens um, and it, finding out what the kittens um, saw after they opened their eyelids uh, after a few weeks, um, was that they didn't see at all well. And they found out that that was because the brain was not programmed. In essence, the same applies to us when you have a lazy eye or amblyopia, uh, either because it's got poor, poor optics or because it's turned in or it's closed by a swollen eyelid, that eye does not develop vision. Um, and that is the occurring in, in the critical period of development, of early development, when vision develops so that it's a chicken and egg phenomenon, which comes first. Is it the brain development or vision or both? And clearly it's both one uh, fulfilling the development of the other. And so from the very earlier stage, vision is programming the brain and it is the act of vision, incoming data um, which is growing the brain and growing the connections and improving the connections so that um, we then have critical periods for the development of language, critical periods for the development of uh, language and facial expression, critical periods for the development of social integration and social learning. All of these um, are fundamentally underpinned by vision. And, and so, so I, I, I get that and I get these critical periods and we can talk a little bit about that. But I'm, I'm thinking of particularly of, okay, so I've got um, a, a child, a, a newborn child. And so in that relationship between visual development and brain development there, it starts immediately. It does. And uh, it's in the 1960s that it was shown uh, that um, um, the uh, faces, when shown as two eyes, a nose and a mouth, um, which were in the right orientation, compared with faces which were two eyes, a nose and a mouth, which weren't in the right orientation, but they were just uh, in a chaotic form, um, the ones that look like faces are looked at for longer time, uh, even within the first few hours of uh, birth. So we th then are, are therefore pre-programmed to look at faces, pre-programmed to engage with the mum. And that is a very deep um, uh, visual process uh, right from the very beginning. Okay, good. So, so then if we've got the faces there, so that's one of the first things, you know, or pre-programmed to look at faces and to recognize faces, then we quickly move, I think, on to... Um, quickly might not be the right word, of course, moving on to something like uh, motor development, uh, spatial awareness, uh, and that interaction and language. So how, how does that develop within the early child? Well, it's a little bit like uh, man has always uh, developed, uh, engineers have always developed uh, televisions, equipment, resources, and they turn out to be an emulation of ourselves. Uh, so that in essence, in essence, um, the, uh, if you wanted a robot to reach for something, the new robots use a neural network processing thing in which they actually learn from their errors. So 
Um, in the same way, an infant, when reaching out for the first time, does so um, with uh, less accuracy. But slowly, uh, as the exploration takes place, the reaching takes place, uh, the picking up um, uh, takes place, a, a progressive process of um, development of brain, development of connections, neuroplastic growth and development take place uh, in the, uh, as a consequence of the facility to explore. And the fact that those, those distressing stories of the Romanian babies uh, who were just left in cots um, for one, two, three years uh, had not had that facility demonstrates that brilliantly because they too had amblyopia, if you like, of reach. Right. And it's, and it's that um, uh, constant development, constant that relationship between visual guided reach and then we have movement, face processing as well. That is that just continu continual feedback system. That interaction need, needs to happen for it to develop. And I think that's part of the experiments we did with kittens, isn't it? Where if we, if we don't have development, if we don't have movement, we don't get that visual processing developing. I remember that in my early psychology days. Yeah, it's a little bit like Shrek, uh, who says it's all onion skins. But here it's a spiral onion skin, where the onion skin is growing and growing and growing in a spiral. Uh, more and more and more layers um, of development taking place uh, in response to success and lack of success. Okay, so, so that's typical development that we see uh, uh, in children there. And obviously I think when, we, when children with, with CVIs and, uh, and, and, the visual, and the behaviors from children with CVIs, we obviously see some forms of different behaviors, different behaviors of children, difficulty in reaching, difficulty in observing uh, 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 facial expressions, difficulty in, in that 3D moving space there. Is that, difficult to assess in very young children? Yes. <laughs> of course it is. Uh, and, uh, and it's because in a sense, um, what we find is that of the cerebral visual impairments, uh, the ones that are very profound uh, become manifest at a very early stage. But the ones that are the least profound uh, become manifest even after going to school. Uh, so they're, because they don't become revealed, because in a sense, uh, we are all, um, if you like, uh, all infants have cerebral visual impairment in its generic sense, because it's the brain itself which is developing. Um, and it's not until you meet the milestones that are expected and that you are going to be able to elicit that there is an anomaly there. And because of the great variability in milestones at the earliest stages, uh, the uh, more subtle deficits can only become apparent um, when they haven't developed at that later stage. So it all depends upon uh, the severity, really, uh, as to how early uh, uh, difficulties can be identified. But I'd like to interject here just at one quick kick point is that children who are at risk of developing it, like children born very prematurely, um, wouldn't it be a good thing to, in a sense, parent them in an optimal way uh, on the assumption that they could develop these problems? Uh, because parenting them in an optimal way is not going to harm them if, if they were going to be uh, developed typically, um, rather than being dependent upon waiting until the problem has arisen before doing something about it. Yeah, no, that's a really good point there, I think. And, you know, there, there are certain risks categories as we know, the prematurity, or those parents, or those children who are born at term, asphyxiation, so forth, that we can start to develop that. And I think that's a really, really good point. The other thing that was, uh, uh, I've been discussing with people on Twitter and, and on various things is, you know how through Hall 4, certainly within Scotland, we have a vision screening uh, 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 around four or five within the schools there as well. I wonder if we could start to implement some kind of CVI screening. You know, I wonder if that can be part of a routine uh, a screening for all children. Well, you could argue that, or you could argue for targeted screening. Uh, screening has to have high sensitivity and specificity. Yep. Uh, otherwise, it's inefficient. 
And so uh, if you uh, were to try to look for something of a low uh, prevalence, well, a low incidence, um, with a technique which is not a very specific and sensitive set of investigations, you have very many false positives um, and cause huge distress by uh, raising a topic when in fact the child hasn't got it. So um, the, 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 the concept framework that we introduced um, for the service we developed in Glasgow of uh, looking at all the children, uh, looking at the vision of all the children uh, who are in the special developmental units, um, I think is definitely worthwhile. But to do it for all children for a low prevalence disorder um, is arguably cost ineffective and potentially detrimental. Arguably. We could, we could Arguably. <laughs> Arguably. All right, good. Okay, so look, back, back, back to the, the major theme of the chat today. So um, I think it'd be really useful if um, you could explain uh, a little bit of the, this, this overlap of, of the behaviours that we can see in children with CVI uh, and those um, behaviours that we see in, in autistic traits as well. You know, I'd be interested to see that overlap and perhaps some of the distinctions there as well. So, so, so do you just want to briefly point out some, some of these uh, behaviours that you've seen? Well, the, I suppose the first children I saw um, uh, along, this, along these lines many years ago uh, had been referred from uh, Dumfries by uh, Isabel Hay, my colleague there who had seen a number of children um, who had had an established diagnosis of having autistic traits, but had also um, manifested in particular uh, what we now know to be features of dorsal stream dysfunction, uh, features of uh, inaccurate reach, um, which she has subsequently researched and published on uh, and shown in a series of 14 children uh, that they had truly did have impaired visual guidance of movement or optic ataxia. Um, and then there may be features of um, light gazing uh, in the more profoundly affected children, uh, which turn out to be quite probably um, related to uh, just being forced by the mind to look at the more, uh, more visible stimulus um, uh, and therefore a form of competitive simultanagnosia. Um, then there are the features in the more high functioning children uh, who have great difficulty uh, extracting words from the printed page or the ones who uh, just hate clutter and tidy things up and line things up. I saw a number of children who lined things up because it meant that they could find them again. It wasn't because uh, they had some aberrant anomaly of um, behavior. It was because it was the most logical thing to do uh, yeah. from their perspective. Um, so there's a whole range of possible behavioral attributes which uh, could be a visual origin. Um, and of course, by appropriate uh, intervention matched to the visual difficulties, um, it could be ameliorated. I think, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll just come to that in a second, I think. Also, um, face processing, of course, you know, it, uh, face processing, I think, is, is hugely, hugely important. So here we are, even though we're, we're distance, we're looking at each other on a screen and, um, you know, we're understanding each other's expressions and, uh, uh, you know, we're playing off of that as well. You know, that social emotional relationship yeah. we have with understanding face processing, of course, children with CVI, you know, some, there may be instances where that is absolutely uh, not possible. And we also see that behavior, you know, according to some of the literature as well, in, in, in those autistic traits as well. So, so yeah, go on. Um, <laughs> I will. Uh, so <laughs> the, the key there is to always think from front to back, I believe. Uh, the first is to think, does this child need glasses? Um, are they short-sighted? Are they very short-sighted? Um, do they have astigmatism? Does that blur their vision? Does that mean they can't see faces properly? And then having made sure of that, uh, checking their, uh, their eyes. Uh, do they have cataract, as uh, some children with autism do? 
Um, do they have um, normal optic nerves, which um, could be caused, or have they been dismissed as having optic atrophy when in fact it's optic nerve hypoplasia related to uh, transsynaptic degeneration back into the eyes from the brain? Um, have they been uh, mislabeled perhaps? And then we move into the brain. And so um, seeking evidence of not being able to see aspects of faces, but then could it be because uh, they have uh, impaired motion detection as many prematurely born children do? Uh, although some children with autism have actually very fast motion perception and can't see slow movement, um, uh, which has been dis described. So we, we can then think, uh, about movement detection. We can think about simultaneous perception. I've met children who've said to their mum, why is it you only have one eye, mummy? Um, because they are truly only seeing one element of the face. Um, and then there are the children that you want me to talk about, uh, which are the ones um, who may have pathology um, affecting the higher levels of uh, face recognition, uh, face recognition can be impaired in some, uh, or may, may have uh, associated difficulties in the, the linguistic interpretation of facial expressions. So, uh, in other words, we have to dissect this out for every child, and every child with autism uh, merits this kind of approach, because how can one learn about uh, the uh, and reciprocate facial expressions if they're not even there? And how can one therefore learn the theory of mind conveyed by facial expression and or gesture if it's not seen due to dyskinetopsia, not seeing movement, um, if it's not there? And if one knows that what is needed to make the language communication there, then one can start to do something about it. So let me get this, let me get this right. Are you saying that um, for all children that may be or, or suspected to, uh, 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 with autism have autistic behaviors, autistic traits, um, that perhaps we need to do this full assessment, you know, starting with the eyes, starting with what Amanda would describe as, you know, the stage one assessment where we do, we check all the refraction, the cataracts and all of that, and the cocomas, we, we check all of those. And then we can start to start to really build up that visual picture of, of those children. Is, is that what you're saying? Um, coming as I do purely from uh, ophthalmology training, I have to be careful here because I don't actually see everybody with autism and the various autistic spectrum disorders. So um, uh, arguing that everybody needs it is, uh, would have to be argued uh, in discussion and debate amongst all the professions. Uh, but for those whom it is clear that there is a specific disability uh, in uh, looking at faces, looking away from faces? Do they do that because they've got simultan agnostic visual problems? Um, yes. Uh, the, in other words, again, is that if you like targeted to those young people who have uh, disorders uh, that appear to be or have a visual origin, of course that needs to be uh, determined, established. Um, by appropriate methods. That, that, okay, good, good. So I, I totally agree with that, by the way, so, so that's fine. Uh, uh, look, I, I, I'm really interested in then um, the kind of assessment tools that we currently have, both within CVI, of course, and also within um, uh, 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 children with, uh, um, with autism and autistic traits. Look, I, I, what really seems to me is that a lot of these tools and I and I teach this you know the theory of mind tasks and, and there are auditory tasks but a lot of these are are, are, are visual tasks so yes. I, 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 I'm slightly worried and I wonder if I should be worried that if I'm assessing joint, atten joint attention tasks or if I'm doing the typical pointing tasks um, you know these are all visually related behavior tasks you know they are steeped within yes. vision, it seems to me and, and that yes. that's clearly has some kind of biasness, I would think. So am I right to be worried? Yes, because the bias is towards ourselves. Uh, inevitably, when we first try to do things of this nature, we are self-referenced and we are therefore assessing others 
from the context of aberrance from our normality, rather than trying to seek um, the anomalies that they've got from their perspective. What I mean by that is that um, many uh, psychological tests, for example, uh, that are performed, first of all, are founded upon having 2020 vision, 6 6 vision. Um, and so they're not fit for anybody with a lower level of vision. So you can scrap them for a start unless they have been uh, matched to the level of vision you've already measured. So first you need to actually measure acuity, contrast, color. And once you've got that, then you have to have matched tests to that level of vision. Um, do those exist uh, within? Oh, I was about to say, um, uh, I'd, be, I'd be really grateful if I could get a list of those. <laughs> I mean, there are some, but there aren't many. That's what I'm getting at. In other words, um, the, what we actually need is a sea change from the point of view of actually making tests matched to their capacity. And I think Leah, uh, sorry, uh, Leah uh, has gone about it that way. She has, um, in the, the contrast faces, uh, hiding Heidi, uh, in those tests, the first thing she does is makes tests which have already been measured to be visible, then diminish in contrast until they become invisible. And you then measure that, and then you use that measure for the rest of time to render everything accessible within that limit. If you just make measurements and file them in a drawer and don't use them to help help the child, then that, to my mind, is unethical. But I've seen lots of unethical testing of filed, stuff filed in drawers, um, which has been invisible to the child from the, first, from the outset, which was wasting the child's time and the practitioner's time because they were implementing tests, seeking aberrance from normality instead of testing for what you're looking for. Can they see the language in a facial expression? And what's the matter with, first of all, rendering your face visible and smiling at the child and asking them what they see and at what distance they see your face from uh, and, and saying, this is a smile. This is me looking sad. This is me looking cross. And what am I doing now? And what am I doing now? And what am I doing now? Um, in other words, increasing the distance. And I was so taken, and I've mentioned this in talks before, by the number of children who said, um, um, I don't know, uh, at a certain distance. And I said to one five-year-old child, and I've quoted this before, um, uh, well, what do I look like then? He said, two black holes in your head, of course, uh, because I'd reached the point at which he knew it was normal not to be able to see a face. So the first thing we should do is use our own faces um, do simple, basic clinical testing and find out whether our expressions can be seen at different distances and then always work within the distance at which it can be seen. Because if you can't see it beyond that distance, and of course you can't learn from it, so of course you're going to be uh, not appear to have theory of mind because you're not returning a smile. Um, whose fault is that? Who's autistic? We are. It's because we haven't got the theory of mind of the child in the first place. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and the amount of tests that are... Uh, uh that are out there that uh, just do not have this in any way considered as huge. You know, it, it's a real, it's a real issue there. So um, because they're ill-founded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, and I guess part of the problem I think is, um, look, I think it's just the scale of economy, isn't it? Really, you know, this is low incidence stuff, and. Uh, uh, you know, do these do the manufacturers want to? Maybe I'm being a bit harsh. I don't know. Want to develop such such of these tests that that they could do uh, yes. uh, for for a small number of children? Exactly. Um, and yet, why are we so hidebound by the development of tests to objectify it for ourselves when all we need to do often is to do the simple practical thing of taking an in-depth history, finding out what the child sees and what they don't see, whether they react to smiles or don't react to smiles, um, and um, eliciting, eliciting it in a clinical way rather than eliciting information on standardized tests seeking aberrance from normality. 
Standardized tests seeking aberrance for normality, instead of finding what the abnormality is, identifying it, quantifying it, finding out what they are, um, is never going to be any use to anybody unless you actually test out and in a practical way, um, in a day-to-day -day living way, what it is the child can see and what they can't. And we're very hidebound by diagnosis. What we need to be is to be, uh, once you've reached the point at which you've made the diagnosis, you need to change and change to become the person who's the habilitationist and to work within what children can actually see and then listen to, hear, learn, and ensure that everything that they are given is accessible. And that's the key, because failing to make things accessible is breaking the disability legislation. Yeah, well, I, I totally agree, you know, and, and, and getting that, I mean, we used to talk about uh, uh, about thresholds, and I still think that's a useful uh, uh, expression, um, you know, in, in trying to understand the threshold of what the child can see and perceive, you know, and, and anything above that just isn't going to be learned, isn't going not to be, there. it's just not there, that's right, it's just not there, but I'm trying, and using our experience, using our history to, to understand that threshold, I think is, is absolutely key. I've got, I've got another slightly, uh, a different kind of question and uh, it's, it, it came about I think reading um, uh, Sylvie's paper and yours uh, which I'll put on all the links on on, on YouTube and it's really the um, uh, uh, the, the area of identification so um, in terms of having an impaired central vision system and then compare it to having an impaired uh, uh, posterior parietal vision leading to these different emotions so, so let's get this clear so what i'm saying about and it relates back to what you said a little bit earlier but i just want to be a little bit clearer about it so having difficulties with um just your the impaired just your eyes your acuity the contrast can generate perhaps the same kind of behaviors is that right as having a difficulty in the parietal uh, lobe here. Yes, um, and it, it's mentioned in that paper uh, that the um, uh, incidence of autistic-like behaviours in children with blindness or profound visual impairment uh, ranges between uh, about 50 to 75 percent, depending upon uh, which papers you read. Um, and so, uh, and, and in my experience, it was the the children who had the great good fortune to have very able parents uh, didn't mean to, didn't mean that they were clever but very uh, sensitive to uh, their children's deficits who actually from a very very early stage um, trained the children in language using a baby talk method of putting singular words to singular experiences from the outset so that they were able to accord meaning and building up that uh, linguistic framework uh, which enabled the child to know and understand um, and with using the words sad when the child was sad or when they were sad and slowly building up in a, a constructive way. I never saw um, autistic behaviors uh, amongst families uh, who parented in that way. It was only the families who had great difficulty understanding and implementing uh, these, uh, th this advice uh, who uh, had children with these difficulties. So clearly um, the, um, the key to bringing about change is uh, training parents how best to parent their child in ways in which all their communication is rendered accessible from the earliest stages of development onwards right the way through life. Um, so melding and molding and changing their language frameworks uh, to match what they know their child actually knows. And, 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 that, and that role, I would suggest, could be the QTVI, <laughs> uh, the habilitation officer, speech and language. It could indeed. It could indeed. And you see, the, the, the tradition that we have in all of our professions is to be doing things to people um, to a certain extent. Uh, and to extend that tradition into empowering them to be able to 
um, so empowering parents, for example, to be able to continue the work whilst after they've gone. Oh, oh, um, absolutely, yeah. And is absolutely essential. And of course, this is, has been done since time immemorial by, uh, by many, many people. And it's fantastic when it happens. Um, and, so, and also empowering the child uh, to know their normality and how everybody else is ab has this abnormal better vision as far as they're concerned, um, so that they can uh, make the best use of the skills they've got and they are empowered to know and understand themselves. And that too uh, is, I, I believe, to be an essential element of uh, good practice too. So that we do everything from within to without, not from without to within. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think a way of getting there, though, I think this is this is uh, that's an outcome uh, that we all want to achieve, too. But I think getting there is um, partly where our roles come into it. And it's that need to need to assess and need to understand what we're assessing, whether it is either something, you know, uh, with the front of the eyes and the eyes or whether it's the brain. We need, we need to really understand our assessment procedures and what we're assessing, I think. Yes, but, but underneath that, we un need to understand the whole visual system, uh, how it grew, how it developed, what goes wrong with it, everything that can go wrong with it, every element that can go wrong, to be able to differentiate every single element, to be able to measure every single element, to be able to get in quickly and accurately and not do lots of redundant tests that don't need to be done, so that you end up by only doing what does need to be done, so that you make best use of your very expensive time, um, so that 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 is um, really uh, used to the best advantage. Um, so uh, sort of top down, outside to in, um, giving all sorts of tests which are formalized um, we are not going to help the children because they get filed in drawers. They're only helping the children to get the resources they need and that's what they're needed for. And then at that point to move into um, that in-depth knowledge of how the brain works, what goes wrong with it, uh, and uh, what and how these different uh, anomalies can affect vision uh, is essential uh, to being able to be a skilled practitioner helping these children. And, and I think having that skilled practitioner understanding helps us then go towards that differential diagnosis. You know, uh, and it's that. Well, yes. Understanding their CVI and then understanding all of these different neurological diagnoses. I think you can't, you can't come up with a differential diagnosis unless you know the whole thing because you don't even have it in your head. And so you can, you, because vision is a hidden disability um, and it's hidden within the head of the person that doesn't see so well, it's not like they're not. They haven't got a um, cerebral palsy, uh, which is visible, and yet c cerebral visual impairment is actually now part of the cerebral palsy uh, diagnostic armamentarium, or it should be, but it isn't because um, of the, uh, the need for training uh, to be able to understand all the potential an anomalies and elements, and therefore to be able to come up with every single element of differential diagnosis, uh, elicit that, and then to, uh, to move from the diagnosis out from medicine straight into habilitation, helping and empowerment. Absolutely. And I think on that, Gordon, uh, uh, um, I'd like to say thank you very much. I think to summarize, I think we need to really understand, understand the child first, right? We've really got to understand the child, its history, the development of the child, uh, we need to understand the tests that we're using, why we're using those tests, and the results from those tests. And then I also need to I think we need to understand then that how we use those results into a, a habilitation and intervention framework. Yes. From that, we can then really start to understand this dichotomy of the questions that I get asked at every presentation I do well, is this autism or is this CVI? And I think once we start to develop these understanding and how to assess and, and this differential diagnosis, then I think we can really begin to tease apart the, that question. Yes, and it's when we have produced a profile, we've profiled each of the elements of vision 
And we need to insert here hearing. We haven't discussed hearing yes, yes, because we yes. need to dis profile each of the elements of hearing as well. And then we need to match all our communication to render it accessible for all elements of learning. We need to match all environments to render them explorable and findable and interesting and dynamic and uh, exciting and, in, and, and fun uh, because only happy children learn. Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. And um, you know, this may be controversial, but it might not be in the sense that this is why interventions that have been designed for children with autism and autistic traits and on the spectrum are not always, uh, if at all, suitable for children with CVI because that hasn't been all considered. No, but I mean, that's the bit I don't know because I am an ophthalmologist. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. So I'm in the position of not knowing what I don't, well, I don't know what I don't know. So um, therefore, uh, clearly there's a big population out there who I've never seen um, who have autism, but if they have elements of vision uh, which are dysfunctional, which are not being catered for because they, the, the people catering for it, haven't got the knowledge that I've got, then clearly we need to work together uh, to uh, remedy this, to ensure that as many elements of uh, being unable to access knowledge from our environments, howsoever we do it, uh, is remedied by ensuring not just the profile of what can't be done, but the, uh, the profile of what can be done, which is even more important because it's the can do elements to compensate for the can't do, uh, which will enable us to create the lock and the key to, uh, uh, to ensure that every child with uh, any form of visual disability is optimally catered for throughout their lives, day to day, by their families, by their teachers and by their friends. Uh, absolutely uh, and, and that strength-based approach as, as I, I would call it you know rather than focusing on that negative focusing on what the child can do and building within that strength-based uh, uh, framework I think is key and I really like what you said there and perhaps we need to give this a little bit more uh, uh, not discussion here but it, but it professionally and across uh, uh, our world is that learning we we can get you know, you're an ophthalmologist I'm an educator psychologist and it's that relationship, perhaps, those who are with, working within autism, those who are working with CVI, let's really get together, let's understand yes. some of those techniques, let's understand what those assessments are, let's understand our field, let's understand your field, but let's get together, because perhaps those intervention strategies, we might be able to learn from each other. And I think that's really key what you highlighted there. Oh, absolutely key. Um, the, that seems to be kind of exclusive thing that that's my topic that's your topic um, and this move towards higher levels of specialization is actually counterproductive um, uh, what we need is renaissance renaissance man i nearly said renaissance person uh, who uh, ha can actually embrace a broad range a broad spectrum of uh, interest uh, and go beyond the boundaries of their own subspecialty uh, into the concept of understanding that education and training uh, is predicated upon access. And uh, unless, uh, and it's predicated upon access throughout one's life from everybody. And unless we actually teach everybody the profile of each child to render and make everything that they uh, going to should learn from, learnable from, um, then we're, we're not going to be doing the best job we can. Yeah, uh, absolutely. All right, Gordon, I've taken yet again more of your time on this beautiful uh, sunny uh, afternoon. We are in week five, week six. I've lost count of lots. Absolutely, that's all right. Yeah, I've, yeah. Even, I've got longer hair, I haven't had it cut yet. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's right. Um, uh, we should look back on our first videos and see. I've, I've lost more hair, I think, and you, you've stolen it, I think, and put, put it on there. So I just want to say, again, thank you very much. Um, it's really, 
It's really fascinating and interesting to talk to you, as you know. And, and hopefully, I think these series of videos we can start to get that collaboration with other professionals. I mean, we're all working at the same aim to support children together. I mean, that's just what yes, we're all absolutely all together. Yes. You know? And, and um, hopefully we can do that. Once again, though, thanks very much, Gordon. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.